Yo, welcome into the B-Ball Jones podcast. The goal of this podcast in my business is to bridge the gap, to fuel hoop dreams, and to impact realities on the court and beyond. So thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoy it. Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the B-Ball Jones podcast. And today I am here with a like a low-key living legend, guys. Like she is uh one of the primary people that you have to know about when it comes to tendon health and especially like the lower extremities when it comes to Achilles and tendons. This is the woman that I've heard on like so many different podcasts and she graced me with the time. There's just a few couple minutes to like share some game about tendons and knees. So I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Ebony Rio. How you doing, ma'am? I'm great. Thank you for that nice introduction. And I don't think I've heard the expression share some game and tendon in the same sentence. So I love it. <laughs> well, I'm glad I was the first to give you that unique of an intro. Um, but I think yeah, that you will share a lot of uh, valuable information for us all. So, um, but I do have to ask you, like, what got you into wanting to know and understand the tendon so much? When I was working at the Australian Institute of Sport, uh, I was looking after the basketball program. I was looking after um, a lot of athletes that had patellar tendinopathy. And it was the injury that sort of kept me awake at night because if the coach came and said, oh, you know, this athlete has a stress fracture, how long would they be out for or how do you measure it or how do you manage it? You know, you could give them really clear time frames. Someone strained a calf muscle, you know, same thing. But as soon as you had someone with tendinopathy, especially in season, there were just so many questions. Do we rest them? Can we strength train? You know, should they be having time off? Can they push through the pain? So I was just really fascinated because um, it was one of the clinical challenges. So I thought it was really cool to try and learn a bit more about it. Mm. So what is your background into this? Like, did you play sports growing up? I still play basketball. I got a game tonight at 8.30. Oh, okay, okay. So we have a Hooper talking about the knees. This, <laughs> this is very special here. Uh, so what's, what's your game like? What, do you, what is your style like? Well, I'm, I'm short, so I'm a point guard or shooting guard. I don't like to find myself in the key. Okay, I got you. So you're more of a pass-first point guard? you traditional point guard? Are you adapted to the shoot-first mentality? Oh, I don't, I'm, a, I'm a shoot-first. <laughs> okay, I got you. I got you. I didn't shoot know first, you pass would. later. <laughs> I'm not mad at it. You know, somebody has to score, so why not be you? You know, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, um, let's start this off very basic, very simple. What is jumper's knee? Okay, so jumper's knee describes the tendon at the front of the knee. So you've got your quadriceps muscle, so the front of your thigh, and it comes mm -hmm. down and attaches to your shin bone um, via this tendon. So jumper's knee refers to an injury of the tendon. And the reason why we call it jumper's knee is we only see it in really exceptional jumping athletes. So we see it in volleyball players and basketball players. Some tennis athletes that change direction, but the reason why we see it in jumping is jumping is when you use your patella tendon, so that um, tendon at the front of your knee, that's when you use that tendon as a spring. So, you know, you're really springy, amazing um, jumping athletes. They're the ones most at risk for injuring this tendon. So that's why it's called jumper's knee. Okay. And you got on to me about this before we started recording, but can you explain uh, the technical term of it? So it's tendinopathy and you have tendinitis. Can you explain what the differences are between those two? Yes. So you're banned from using the term tendinitis. And the reason for that <laughs> is it's really outdated. But the problem with it as a word is if you say that to any of your friends or your family, you know, I've got tendinitis, you know, what do you think I should do about it? Everybody thinks that they should do really passive treatment like rest or ice or anti-inflammatories. And we know that that's not effective. So actually the correct term is patellar tendinopathy. And so patella is your kneecap. So it just refers to the tendon over your kneecap. And so we try and avoid the word. Well, actually, we do avoid the word tendonitis because um, people don't engage with active rehab. And we know that rehabilitation and exercise is actually the best management for this. There's no evidence for rest, ice, anti-inflammatories, um, injections or anything like that. So language is so important and not just in 
tendons, we see that in other conditions, depending on the words we use, people have different perceptions about what they think they need to do about it. So that's why we avoid tendonitis, so that people don't um, be really passive in their management because it doesn't work. So where did Does the that whole... make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but where did the whole rest and ice thing come from then if it you know doesn't work? So I think that it's very historical. That's the advice that's given for most injuries. It's kind of the generic, um, you know, something hurts, you should rest and mm-hmm. put ice on it and um, take anti-inflammatory. So it's very um, generic and historical, but definitely not effective for tendinopathy. Okay, got you. So with with the jumper's knee, yep. what is the actual cause of it? Like we're playing basketball, what happens from I don't have it to at some point do having it? Mm, it's a really good question. So it's related to how much jumping load you do. So the more you do, the more at risk you are. But mm. if we take a step back, the activity that you did when you were growing, so during adolescence, um, determines uh, kind of the structure of that tendon. So what can happen during that period is you can get some changes in your tendon and in some people that goes on to cause pain, but not everybody. So some people can have those changes in their tendon and never have knee pain, never have jumper's knee. So it's a risk. It's a risk factor, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. So we don't really understand a lot about why people get it other than um the more, the more you jump, the more likely you are. So that's why we see predominantly in men because they mm. jump more in training and predominantly in our better jumpers. So can we get to a point where it's not a thing in our lives or is it just a thing we always have to deal with? No, you can definitely get to a thing where it's um, a point where it's not a thing in your life. You can be pain-free and totally functional. What we probably won't change is how your tendon looks on an ultrasound or an MRI, but we don't care. That's not an outcome. So we don't use that as a measure of how you're going. We use your pain and your function as a measure, and you can absolutely recover from jumper's knee. Definitely. Mm. Okay, that's good to know. So. You just gave a lot of hope to a lot of people out there, including me, that good. <laughs> I can have good knees. <laughs> definitely. What you might need to think about is um, it, it can be slow, definitely. And mm-hmm. you might need to think about different strategies depending on whether or not you're in season or you're in the off season. So your program might look a little bit different in terms of how you manage your tendon and the strength. But the last thing we want to do is rest. So what you wouldn't want to do is get to the end of your basketball season and do nothing because it'll just come back next season. So there's a little bit of work to do to keep it away. But the work that you do to protect your tendon also helps you be a better athlete because you're going to be stronger and jump higher anyway. So dual benefit. Okay, so what would the in-season versus off-season scheduling or style look like for working out your jumper's knee? Yeah, good question. So how many times a week do you play? Oof. Ugh. I don't play right now because of that, and it's just time oh, and wow. everything. But, uh, so this is just is a consult. This isn't a podcast. You just want me to sort your knee out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's say, let's let's base it on playing um, twice a week and training mm-hmm. once or training twice, playing once. Let's go with some really easy numbers. The first thing we want to try and do is have time in between those really big jumping loads. So the mm-hmm. ideal scenario would be you would train Monday and you would train Wednesday and you would play Saturday. What the knee would find challenging is to train Monday, Tuesday, you know, play Saturday and then have the rest of the week off. Mm -hmm. So tendons like time between those, we call them high tendon load. Now, when I'm talking about high tendon load for the patella tendon, I'm talking about using it as a spring. So that's your big jumping. But it's also some of the um, fast change of direction. You know, when you sort of lunge forward and propel yourself back the other way um, Mm -hmm. in, you know, a a quick change of direction um, or, you know, defense or offense, that can all, that's also using your patella tendon as a spring. So what we need is to try and separate those sessions in the week, if we can, at least to begin with. So we mm-hmm. might do three sessions a week and they're spread out. That would be the first thing if you can schedule. So 
for the players that are recreational out there, try and schedule your shooting practice and your own training on the court um, with at least a day in between your game if your knees are sore at the moment. That's the first thing to do in season. The next thing to do is to make sure that you're doing really good strength training. So strength is critical, but it doesn't overload your knee. So it's not high load for the tendon. So the tendon will love strength training and it will love the loads being heavy because it's not hard for the tendon if things are heavy. The things that are hard for the tendon are where you ask it to act like a spring. So our schedule might be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, basketball. Um, so or Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, I think I said. So then I'd get you in the gym Tuesday, Thursday, um, Sunday. And in the gym, we'd make sure that your calf strength was really good. So the calf is the muscle um, on the back of your shin um, that attaches to your Achilles. It's also really important in jumping, but it also absorbs a lot of the load. So that would be a combination of standing calf raises, but also seated calf raises. And I'd get you to do it single leg bit on each side. Mm. In season, I'd also get you to do some work for that quadriceps. So that's the muscle attached to the tendon. And that mm. might be a leg extension. So seated, um, straightening your leg with weight. So on a machine and also potentially a leg press. The two um, loads in the gym that your knees will love in season are isotonic. So that means moving the weight um, concentrically and eccentrically. So for your knee joint, that's straightening your leg and bending. And mm -hmm. it, your tendon also loves isometric. So that's a static hold. That's when you just hold the weight and don't move at all. And both of those loads in the gym are fantastic in season. What we don't want to add in season is any more plyometrics or any more spring activity for the tendon because you're getting enough on court. Mm. So that's what we do in the off seat, in the um, in season management. We do isometrics and isotonics, but you've got to stay in the gym. We used to think that we needed to rest you in between uh, training and games, and it's no good. Rest is no good. You need to be in the gym. Um, in the off season, because you're not playing in training, we'd need to take you through a progressive program that retrained your tendon as a spring. So we'd add in some stairs and some jumping and some change of direction work to get, build you back into the court work. But we wouldn't add anything extra like that in season because it's too much. It's also a myth to just do eccentrics. That might be something that your listeners have heard to do. Yeah, that was uh, something I wanted to ask you about. So um, let's go back to the three separate days. So yeah, what would each day look like um, for each session? Yep. So um, let's say your knee is pretty happy. And the way we know your knee is pretty happy is how you pull up the day after a, a training or a game. Mm -hmm. So on a Monday, if you go and do... Um, an hour and a half training session and your knee pain the next morning is the same or better than it was Monday morning, your knee's been happy with the hour and a half training. Let's say you did three hours and you get up the next day and it's seven out of 10, it's worse. That's your knee saying you overdid it at training. And this is the tricky thing about tendons is it won't always tell you at the time. It usually tells you 24 hours after. So we have to use that 24-hour pain to listen to how we would schedule the next session. So if we go to the example of your happy knee. So you've done an hour and a half on Monday. You've changed direction. You've jumped. You've, you know, had a great session. Tuesday, you go to the gym. You do your seated calf work, your standing calf work, your quadricep work, plus anything else you need to do, but they would be the key things. On Wednesday, because your knee was happy with an hour and a half, you could do an hour and a half again, or you might do an hour 45. You might do a little bit more and see how it pulls up. On the Thursday morning, if your knee is still the same or better, it's happy with an hour 45. On the Thursday, you'd go to the gym, you'd do the same strength training, and then you'd you know, keep going through your week. If your knee wasn't happy, so on the Monday night you did three hours, the next day you're worse, 
you still go to the gym Tuesday. That's critical and you'll feel better for it. But then when you do the Wednesday um, training session, you need to do less because your knee told you that three hours was too much. So in season, the key is finding the amount of load that you can do to keep your pain low and stable. It actually doesn't need to be zero. It's very safe. You want your symptoms to be low and stable the day after training or a game. And sometimes you might need to play around with that a little bit. And so training, for example, um, you know, see what you can do. If your knee's happy and your pain is the same or better, you can do a little bit more. If your knee's not happy, do a little bit less until you find the amount that you can do. It's usually easiest to modify volume. If you do have the ability to take out specific stuff, then the specific stuff you take out is additional jumping or lots of work in the quarter court. Tendons don't mind running. Patella tendons are happy to run. So you can do all the full court scrimmage. But in the quarter court where you're doing lots of fast change of direction, it's a lot of that tendon load with the changing direction. So you've got to think of those two loads. So the easiest thing is often to limit volume, but if um, you do want to limit the specifics of training, it would be jumping and the big lunging change of direction. Hey, hold on. Oh, time out. Time out real quick. We're going to get back to the episode. I know you're enjoying it. I know you're enjoying the show, but I need you to help me real quick and to make sure that this episode can grow, make sure that this podcast the show can grow overall, and you can keep getting great guests like this, make sure that you subscribe and follow along. So if you watch right now on YouTube, Help me out by hitting the subscribe button. Okay, go ahead and do it real quick. If you're listening in your car, chill out for a second. Um, if you're on Apple or on Spotify, just like when you get a moment, hit the follow button. But not right now while you're driving. If you're working out or something, or you're still in your room, then go ahead and subscribe with me. Like, help me help you, okay? But thank you for watching. I really appreciate you. Uh, I'm going to stop interrupting. Let's get back to the episode. Thank you. Mm, okay. And with the isotonics versus isometrics, any throwing eccentrics in there too. Um, how would you work through all of those? Like, would you focus on the isometrics first and the isotonics and then later the eccentrics? Like, how would you structure all of that together in that day or throughout the program? Yep. So, don't do eccentrics on their own and especially mm -hmm. don't do them in season. So, there's evidence that it makes people worse and makes people more sore. So, um, we don't use the single leg decline board as an exercise we use it as an assessment because it's too it's too provocative it hurts too much so in season no eccentrics only but people can do isometrics and isotonics they don't need to start with isometrics do them for a while and move on both of them are safe and the reason for that is the loads that are hard for a tendon are fast it's when we ask your tendon to act like a spring. So anything static or slow is really safe. If you have someone that has knee pain with static or slow loads, it's not the tendon. It's the joint. Mm. So anyone that's listening to this goes, oh, but my knee hurts when I do leg extension. It's probably patellofemoral joint pain, so knee joint pain and not the tendon. Mm. Yeah, that's a big, important factor. Um, Very big. A lot of people um, have joint pain when they're told they have tendon pain. So with the isotonics, is that more of the um, timed workouts? Is that more of the, you know, two up, one down time? Yeah. Or metronome? Yeah, spot on. So I do like three up, four down. So super slow, lots of time under tension. Gotcha, so for okay. like four by six or four by eight, um, and you don't need a long rest period. So you could do like left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, and your rest period is just doing the other leg. Um, I want all of your listeners to make sure that they understand to do each leg as hard as you can. So when you strength train one side, you actually get some transfer of strength over onto the other side because of the way the brain controls your movement mm -hmm. and that's called cross education so the way we um, harness that is to uh, just say you've got right-sided patellar tendinopathy and you can lift 27 kilos with that leg I don't know what it mm -hmm. is in pounds 
on your other side, if you can do 50, you should do 50. So don't punish your asymptomatic leg, your left leg, and do less because you'll just get weaker and weaker. What you'll do is actually drag up your right side and you'll become symmetrical faster. So just make sure people work each side really hard. Okay. And when it comes to the leg extensions um, isometrically, yep. do we play around with certain angles? Because I know sometimes if you have it at a joint specific angle that's similar to the sport, that'll help it right there. But how do you know exactly what the angle is to have it at? That's a really good question. So you, most people with patellar tendinopathy aren't um, comfortable with their leg completely straight and they're also not very comfortable with it at 90 degrees so anywhere in between that between 45 and 60 that mid-range should be really comfortable mm. and if we feel pain there how do we assess if it's the good hurt versus i need to stop and change things yeah so what I would say is try holding it for, um, try, you know, your three sets of 45 seconds by your third set, it should be feeling better. If it's not feeling better, um, you could try changing the angle. It might be that you've, that the joint is a bit irritated because sometimes the joint doesn't like the heavy isometrics and isotonics. Um, for anyone listening that does have joint pain, um, they also need to include some more work at the hip. So the hip's been shown to be really important. So like your, your gluteal muscles um, and the, your glute med and glute max. Um, but they could do a lighter load until it's comfortable. So you could just drop mm. your load. And how much does the hip matter when it comes to that? Because I think this might be the first time I heard the hip playing. I know it impacts it because the body's a chain and, hmm. you know, if the knee hurts, it go up or go down from it. But how much does that impact the knee rather than the actual knee or like the quad? Yeah, the, the hip can have quite a big role, especially in patellofemoral joint pain. That's because the muscles of the hip uh, determine the angle of your femur, so the long bone of your thigh. And mm -hmm. so if the hip muscles aren't doing a very good job, that knee can really go in. Um, so you might have heard the term valgus. It's where you kind of look mm -hmm. a bit knock knee when you jump or when you land, and that mm -hmm. can change the loads that go through the knee. So the hip can be really important. So people could do that with a, um, a like standing cable machine to get some abduction. So that's taking your leg away from your body. Or you can do a side plank, lifting your top leg. But the hip is one not to forget. Mm. And when it comes to doing, let's say, a quiet focus exercise, how much of a difference does open chain versus closed chain matter? So something like you said, the knee extension versus uh, TKE, how much would that matter? So the, the reason why the leg extension is really important is it really isolates the quadricep muscle. And we know from research, but also seeing athletes, that when people have patellar tendinopathy, they have a lot of quadriceps muscle wasting. So when you do other exercises like a squat or, um, you know, even a leg press, you use different muscles and the quadriceps can hide. It can be a little bit sneaky, whereas the leg extension, you can't use anything else. You are using your quadricep muscle. So if we're trying to address um, strength and function and asymmetries, we need to be quite isolated, especially to begin with. Eventually, we want to put it together in a chain, as you said. Mm -hmm. But to begin with, if someone has a really small quad, I'm going to give them a leg extension. If they've got a really small calf. I'm going to give them seated and standing calf raises, single leg but each side. You know, if, if their glute muscle is down, I'll give them specifics. Before I move into something like walking lunges, Bulgarians, even double leg squats, because a double leg squat just gives my quadricep and my tendon an opportunity to hide. Mm. So do you have any specific uh, glute exercises that you like to pull out? Yeah, I like the, uh, what do I like? I like the cable machine with the cable around um, the thigh and you can pull the machine, pull your leg away so that mm -hmm. can target 
and you're standing on one leg so you get some good stability in your stance leg but you'll also get some good load through the leg you're moving you can then turn and face um the other way and pull it into extension and pick up a lot of glute max Mm -hmm. um you can do the same thing with a standing hip machine but a lot of gyms don't have those the if you are going to use a squat rack then it's best if it's um in a cage not free weights and -hmm. what you can do is you can walk forward so that you've got a completely vertical tibia so in knee pain your knee doesn't tend to like going over your ankle to begin with which means Mm -hmm. things like free squats um, or front squats um, can be quite provocative. They can be quite sore. So if you walk forward, you can almost do a back squat, single or double leg, and have a vertical tibia. So that's your shin bone, and mm. that's way more comfortable, and you can get a lot of glute work there as well. So that's a nice one if people have gym access. Mm. So what about uh, reverse walks or you know using a sled to pull? because just i know for me personally I use it as like a warm up before i get into the gym and do things um how do you feel yeah, about those it. for any help you love it no okay. they're great they're fantastic exercises brilliant so, so you how... should push push the sled for your calves and pull the sled as well for your quads got you so how would you both. use that would you use that early on to kind of isolate the quads a little bit or how would you use that one it's not super isolated so you could yeah. but you could have it on early on as well as you had the other ones in there so it could be in the same program as a leg extension um it's not very isolated but it's a great whole chain exercise but it but it's very safe to do that could go in quite early okay gotcha and that can go in in season that's really safe that's a great exercise yeah i'm becoming a big fan of it because it's it's uh, it's the knees over toes guy and he talks about it a lot and he just says like if you just walked backwards for a certain amount of time your legs would be on fire just because we're so unprogrammed and unconditioned yep. to go that direction. So your yeah, body so just like true. gets a whole wake up call. So, yep, I love it. Um, now let's talk about the fun part um, about the training, which is the plyometrics, because that is the gift and curse of basketball players. So. <laughs> How do we work in, let's say we're in off-season mode, how do we work in the plyometrics to where, because you can't just be strong in your legs, you actually actually have to have, like you said, the tendon working as a spring. So how do we work in the plyometrics when it comes back to it? Yeah, great question. So the first thing I'll say is that that's the main, my main criticism of most of the research is that only looks at the strength phase. It doesn't retrain the spring. Um, Mm. So... The first thing to consider is making sure you are strong enough to withstand those loads. So the preparation you do before you do the plyometrics is really important. So I'm going to give you some numbers. So for the athletes um, listening that play basketball a couple of times a week or once a week, it's really good to be able to do at least 30 to, 30 to 35 single leg calf raises. So with really good technique and good technique means keeping your knees straight, going all the way up to the top and not rolling your ankle out. You would also then need um, to be really strong through the rest of your leg. And one of the measures that we use to capture that is the leg press machine. On the leg press machine, we'd like you to be able to lift um, one to one and a half times your body weight single leg for four lots of six and that's because when you're landing from a jump or changing direction you put a lot of load through your body so if you are strong enough to do that exercise we can start to add um, some faster spring type work so once people have a pretty decent capacity in their calf and a pretty decent capacity in the rest of their leg. You know, for some athletes, I might have more measures than that, but for a lot of um, athletes, that'll give you a good idea of where you're at, and that's for left and right leg. Then what we do with the tendon is we break down the energy storage and the, the release of the energy. So the way we might do that is to run up to a wall and plant just say it's your right leg, plant your right leg. So you sort of practice that deceleration 
but what you mm-hmm. don't practice is the um, the two phases, so the in and the out. So we might just start with the deceleration. So you run up mm-hmm. and plant, or we might do a split squat jump where we um, store a little bit of energy and land, and then we need to progress that into continuous split squat jumps. And the way we train um, the tendon is we just break down the movements that you need to be able to do. So you need to be able to decelerate, change direction, um, you know, jump. And so that's exactly how I'd write your program. And I'd count the numbers. So I'd get you to do a specific number of decelerations. And I'd tell you to listen to your tendon the next day. And if it's happy, your pain will be low and stable. And Mm -hmm. the next time we did that um, energy storage activity, we could do more. If your tendon wasn't happy, the next time we did that energy storage activity, we'd do less. And we'd schedule those energy storage spring sessions with time apart the way we do in season. So I'd get you to do it alternate days rather than back-to-back days. Um, So we'd progressively improve your spring with retraining the height and retraining the speed and and the distance. We can also use that with going up and down stairs, especially two and three stairs at a time on the way up can really build a great spring. So that's another nice strategy. But we need to build up quite a lot to then go back into something like, you know, a basketball training session. And what about the leg extensions? Will you uh, include the leg extensions as part of your uh, return to play requirement assessment? Yeah, it's tricky to have a number on that because it's different depending on the machine that people use and it's often relative to your own um, body weight. So that's why we use the calf endurance because that's me lifting my own body weight 35 times. It's you lifting your own body weight. And mm-hmm. the leg press, same thing. It's it's relative to my body weight. The trick with the leg extension is my my max might be, you know, 40, but I've got athletes that can do 70. So it's hard to put a number on the leg extension, but what you want to do is be as symmetrical as you can. And for any athletes listening, I wouldn't want you below 30 kilos. All right. Okay. Another time out. Okay. Look, if you got to this point, you have to be enjoying the episode. Like you have to, at this point in the episode, you're enjoying it. So help me help you just, if if you're on Apple right now and you're on, and you're on your phone, okay, just take your phone, press the subscribe button. It's right there. Just do that with me. Even if on your laptop, take your mouse, boom, click over, boom, do your thing. Now you subscribe. Now you linked in because you don't want to miss the next great episode that I have. But doing stuff like this helps the episode grow, makes the show grow, and the podcast grow so I can keep getting great guests and keep doing great interviews. So if you listen on Apple or Spotify, take a second, look at your phone, press the follow button, okay? And share with a friend or two. Because you're finding value in this. You want to have this conversation with your friends so they can have the same value. Now the whole basketball community can grow. All right. Thank you for listening so far. I'm going to get out your way. Let's get back to the episode. Appreciate you. And in the off season, people need to keep up their strength. So you reach those measures and then you keep strength training two to three times a week. And then you add in the those energy storage, those spring exercises on the other days. Okay. and. For the plyometrics, like you said, the energy storage. Yep. Do you do any low-level plyometrics with it, do you, or is it just more of the deceleration work? Give me an idea, an example of what you might do. So, example, just for the calves, you know, you would do more of like pogo hops or um, jump ro- jumping rope or something like that. Yeah, as yeah, a lower great. Level. Yeah, definitely. And because they're not high load for the patella tendon they can go in quite early Mm. because if you're jumping rope or doing pogos you're actually not using your patella tendon as a spring so they're really safe they can go in okay yeah so is there any because i I was trying to find and look for it but i don't see anything that's like a, a lower level knee dominant plyometric exercise yeah, so I would call a lower level knee dominant exercise something like a split squat jump that's shallow. Mm. And then I'd and progress if, that. Sorry, go. No, go ahead, go ahead. 
I was going to say, and then I'd progress that in terms of the depth, but also the continuous nature of it. So when you're thinking of a low level knee dominant exercise, the first thing is be shallow. That's, that's low level and mm-hmm. separating energy storage. So deceleration or separating the first part of the jump into the second part of the jump. And then when you combine them, that's more challenging. Um, and obviously single leg is more challenging than double leg. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's how you can think about breaking it down. So first go shallow and go, you know, double leg if you need to, then progress depth, um, then progress uh, to one leg and then progress to energy storage and release. So the continuous nature. So repeated jumping, repeated forward hopping, repeated split squats. That's the hardest tendon load. And what about anything that's band assisted? So you have the band anchored above you, like say to a pull-up rack or like you said, a squat rack, and you're using the band to kind of uh, lighten your load so the knee doesn't feel as much pressure coming down. Would you use that inside the program too? It's a good question. I don't tend to, but I know a lot of strength and conditioning coaches that do. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think think you could do that. The key thing is tendons don't like change, so you'd need to be quite consistent in the band that you used. Um, and mm-hmm. making sure, you know, your depth was the same and your numbers and all of that stuff and that you didn't just go from that to no assist without a transition, but I'm sure, you know, you wouldn't anyway. But it's definitely an option for people to try and they can see whether or not they like it and, you know, their knee will tell them the next day. Yeah. But the key thing we don't want to do is combine our plyometric day with our strength day tendons like time between those plyometric loads. So that's the problem with those band assist exercises is it muddies the water at the low tendon load day, which is your strength day. Um, So as long as people are doing those on separate days. Okay. And what about if a player is jumping onto a box? Would that be considered a lower level to an extent? Yeah, it would, especially if the box is low and then you could progress it. Um, What we like to do with tendon rehab is self-generated load. So you can jump onto a box, but I don't usually jump off a box. Um, We usually just jump because that way you can't jump higher than your capacity because you can only Mm -hmm. jump as high as you can jump, whereas you can jump Mm -hmm. off a really high box and it might be way more load than you're capable of taking. Mm -hmm. And what about using the metronome to kind of uh, progress that? So, you know, you start off slow and then because you you do kind of blend the energy storage and release with that. So if it's slower paced, it's land, you kind of store it and then you progress it to where you land the store. It's a little bit quicker and you progress more to it even quicker. Would you use that too? Definitely. Yeah, that's great. So I use the metronome in my um, strength training. So for example, on the leg extension or leg press, three second concentric, four second eccentric, um, that helps change the neural pathways, which we know are altered in jumper's knee. So it's a really important part of people's rehab. So um, Mm -hmm. I'm going to give a bit of a plug here. I've designed an app called Rehabil Attendant. Um, So you can download Mm -hmm the app and it's got the metronome built in it's got the isometric exercise it's got the isotonic exercise on there Um, it also helps you adjust the leg extension if it's sore remember how you said before what if it's painful so the app can help you do that Um, so that's a shameless plug for my new app that I've just released Um, but you can use the metronome at faster speeds as well as you're progressing through that spring phase so if I was going to get you on stairs for example I might get you walking upstairs, um, lots of great calf work as well on the stairs and calves are so important for your knee. And I might start you on 100 beats per minute. And then as I progress you up past 150 and, you know, you're running upstairs, it's really good energy storage for your lower, for your leg tendons, energy storage okay. and release actually. And so we're using the metronome. How yep. would we track it and progress it? Will we just do it for a time frame and count the number of jumps we have and how do we increase that from there do we speed up the time first i mean i mean the beats per second first or add more jumps how do we at some point elevate and progress yeah i'd add more jumps first so i'd add volume first before i add speed so remember the hardest thing for a tendon is doing it quick 
is acting like a spring. So that's what's hard for a tendon is that really fast speed. So the highest patella tendon load is a counter movement jump or like a pull up jumper in basketball where I'm dribbling, dribbling, dribbling and I decelerate and I go from horizontal to vertical. That mm-hmm. is the highest load. So um, if we work backwards pr- from that, we that's very fast. So things that are slower are where we start with, but I'd build volume um, before I added too much speed. I'd add speed last. Mm, okay. Um, when it comes to diet, I've heard a lot of the collagen and vitamin C. How does that actually help our knees out too? Hmm. I don't think we really know is the honest answer. I think we don't know how much makes it through your body and all of the processes and um, into the tendon. So Mm -hmm. the theory, like the laboratory theory is quite strong, but I don't think we've seen good evidence yet at a human level. But I'm open to like hearing more about that in the future. The key things around diet are actually um, particularly around muscle recovery. So if you're doing really good strength work, you're actually going to get some muscle soreness and some breakdown of your muscles. So you need to make sure that your nutrition is good enough for your muscle recovery and that'll actually help your tendon because if your muscles aren't doing their job, the load goes to your tendon. Um, The key things that I would say to people is don't spend a lot of money on it. That's not where you get the most bang for your buck. The most bang for your Mm. buck is going to be on your gym membership. So if people Mm. want to, um, like they should be focusing on the key things um, because there's not good evidence for anything else at the moment. So people shouldn't be spending a lot of money on it. Mm. So how much of a impact do you think or feel that the collagen and vitamin C plays into it? As far as you know. Not much. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So um, can you explain the whole ibuprofen thing and why that is not a good idea for us to take when we have the knee pain? Yeah. So um, the actual... So anti-inflammatory... So the condition isn't inflammatory. Ibuprofen might have some other impacts on different processes. you know, might help pain a little bit. But Mm -hmm. if you're masking your pain, you're not listening to your tendon. And pain's there for a reason. So we actually want you to listen to your tendon, adjust your load and get it right. Um, People don't also report that it helps a ton. And so you're sort of, you know, doing taking medication often over a long period of time with tendinopathy and that's not great um and we just want people to really focus on the rehabilitation because that's where the evidence is rather than the the anti-inflammatory injections or medication Mm. so is there anything within the diet that um will help overall like you said having a good diet but it's like is there any particular area to focus in a little bit more yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think we have the answer to that yet. So there's been no studies that have really um, strongly linked to anything. There is some research out of the Netherlands that's starting to look at diet and tendinopathy. And um, people have looked at um, at uh, collagen definitely, but it's more theoretical. Um, glycerin is the other one that people have looked at. And, you know, I, I used to have a dancer at the Australian Ballet who used to swear by eating jelly. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of people have a lot of theories, but there's been no strong link that's associated with um, improving pain or tendon health at the moment. So I think if people focus on um, good nutrition, that's the most important thing. But watch this space. There might be some great research in the next couple of years where we can kind of say, actually, this is really important to, you know, Mm -hmm. eat more of this and that will really help. So Mm -hmm. it's an evolving field, which is great. Yeah, I think the more we learn about it, it'll come uh, more factors that play a role. So it's like you said, right now, Yep. Nutrition, nutrition doesn't have anything about it, but you never know. Like in five years or five months, you could come out to say, "Hey, we need to eat potatoes," and that's the main thing to help jumpers knee out, or you know, whatever it is. So absolutely, um, and that's one of the great things about research is um, 
I think we should all be open to change. You know, I, mm-hmm. I hope that, you know, I can come back on your podcast and we've got more research and more answers and more ways to help people so that we've got um, options to help people. Well, you, you're definitely welcome back. Um, just let me know. I'm nothing but a message away in your anytime. Uh, thank you. Uh, but the last thing I do want to ask you about is kind of the mobility and stretching factors. Um, does that help or hurt the knee some? Hmm. This, it is another good question that we don't really know because there hasn't been a lot of research that have looked at um, uh, enough people, but the research doesn't support that it helps. So stretching is often used as a as a placebo, like a sham treatment compared to other things. So um, there's not what people don't want to do is kneel on their knees. The knees are never mm. comfortable being knelt on. Tendons hate being squashed. Um, I think it's probably more comfortable for people to use a foam roller on their quad than to do a quadriceps stretch. Um, there's mm. probably not great evidence for stretching anyway to improve flexibility. So if people are looking to improve flexibility, the best intervention is to be stronger because if you're strong, your muscle will allow you to access your range of motion. So you can stretch till the cows come home. But if you're not strong enough, the muscles will tighten up to protect the joint. Um, mm. So people can stretch for recovery, but it's not something, if I said to you, you know, if you're really tired, go to sleep because the best recovery is sleep. Don't stay mm. up to stretch or ice bath or anything. So it's it's not a it's not a huge priority. It's fine to do, but not a massive priority if, if people are time poor. Mm. Is there um, any mental connection to the knee? Like anything that we that you know about with the research and studies that say there's a mental connection as far as um, the somewhat of the sports science, somewhat of the sports psychology aspect of it, there's any connection to that, to the knee? So because pain is an output of the brain and it's the combination of, you know, lots of different inputs, there's no doubt that, you know, um, stress and mental health and um, the environment and all of those things play into our experience as a human. Um, But there hasn't been a lot of research on the patella tendon and some of the tools that are used in research aren't very good for tendons so there's research into like people having fear of movement and but those tools that people use those questionnaires were developed for you know low back pain so they're just not that relevant so again it's another really exciting space that I hope in the next couple of years we have a better understanding but what I'd say to everybody listening is looking after your mental health is is super important for anyone um but especially people with pain tendinopathy included and looking after your nutrition so all of those aspects of health will help your patella tendinopathy definitely mm. yeah that's you, you're a human your, t- your tendon is contained within you as a human it's not separate so yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I've I've so just it, seen the time. I'm really sorry. Um, no, that's fine. I was I was just about to wrap it uh, up. Uh, is there anything else that you want to say for anybody that's listening? Um, hang in there. Keep working hard. You'll have good days and bad days, but listen to your tendon. And if your tendon's happy and your pain is low and stable, just keep going. But keep up your strength work. Keep going, and you will get better. Well, that's it, guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for your time, Dr. Ebony. And Pleasure. if you guys enjoyed this, just like and uh, share, subscribe below. But thank you for guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. That's it. See you next week. Awesome.